My name is Allison Alcott. I'm a geologist, and I've been working at Rockware as a trainer and consultant since 2000. Um, thank you very much for attending. We know that a lot of you have either stayed up late or gotten up early to attend this meeting, and we really appreciate it. During the next 20 minutes, I'll quickly give an overview of the plume modeling tools available in the Borehole Manager portion of the Rockworks 15 software. One thing I want to mention before we get started is that Rockworks includes tools for the modeling of numerical data, such as concentration data, in the Rockworks utilities part of the program, as well as the Borehole Manager. But because of time limitations, I'm going to focus on the Borehole Manager portion of the program, which includes a relational database for storing downhole and, in some cases, time-based data. This outline shows the sequence in which the information will be presented. Please feel free to type questions into the GoToMeeting chat box at any time, and we'll either address them during or after the presentation. So let's get started. The first thing I want to do is get the boring stuff out of the way and talk about where you might store your data in the Borehole Manager database. Concentration information is typically stored in three tables in the database, the interval data table, the P data table, and the T data table, which is basically an interval-based time and, and time-based table. This is an example of what the interval data table looks like. It's really just a generic place to store downhole numerical information linked to intervals. So the database has a field for both a top and a base depth. Um, and then you can store as many types of measured values as you need to. Um, we typically see concentration information from soil samples stored here, and we also often see geotechnical and assay data stored here. Um, I see that a few new people just joined the, the meeting, and I want to welcome you and let you know that um, you can um, type any questions that you have into the chat box, and we'll address them either as we get them or, or at the end of the meeting. So anyway, that covers the iData. Um, it's it's soil-based, soil typically soil sample concentration information, and also a place to store geotechnical information and sometimes, you know, mining assay data for people in other industries. This is an example of what the P data table looks like, and it's it's basically identical to the interval-based table, except for we just have a single that a single um, field for a depth value. Um, we typically see more densely spaced data, such as geophysical data stored here, um, but we also are seeing more and more MIP data stored here. Um, it, the data is plotted in strip logs as curves. Um, there's really no reason you couldn't just store concentration data here as well if you want to link it to a single interval, but we would recommend that you only do that if you have multiple samples per borehole. It wouldn't work very well if you just have a single, say, a single soil sample or a, a single screened interval per, per borehole. And then last but not least is the T data table. And this is typically where we see people store monitoring well information because there is a field for the date. Um, so, and, and the top and base depth typically corresponds to the top and base of your screened interval or, you know, perhaps the top and base of your saturated interval. And again, you can have as many columns as you need to for additional types, for, for um, concentration data for different types of concentration data. And when you create a strip log or a model from this, you have an option to query based on dates. You can um, only model or display data for a specific sampling event. Next, I want to talk about how you can visualize your observed data in the program. Before you start working on a model, it's a really good idea to take a look at your data and we have a look at the actual raw data and we have a number of different ways um, for doing that. If, you're, if you want to display your data in two dimensions, the Borehole Manager includes tools for plotting T data and some other types of data in two-dimensional maps. Unfortunately, this option isn't avail is not available for I data and P data, um, but, but if you needed to plot those values, you could transfer the data into the utilities um, for mapping. The T data menu includes tools for time series charts and time series maps, which I'll show you shortly. And the um, and downhole concentration data can also be displayed in 2D strip logs. So what I want to do now is switch over to the Rockworks program, and first give you kind of a brief um, a brief tour of the Borehole Manager for those of you who may not be familiar with the program, and then show you how data can be displayed in these two-dimensional diagrams. So this is the Borehole Manager database. If I click on the utilities over here, it takes me into a completely different set of tools that we won't cover in this 
this um, this talk, but just keep in mind that they're there. In the Borehole Manager, I have a Project Manager over here on the left, this panel, and that just basically allows me to kind of organize and quickly view models and diagrams created in the program. To the right of that, I have a Borehole Data Manager pane that lists the boreholes or wells in the project. And then to the right of that, I have a list of different tables that I can access in the database. Um, as I click on different boreholes, notice that the data over here changes, so that's the way that I access data for different boreholes. And as I click on different tables, notice that the program displays data for different types of, um, displays um, the spreadsheets basically for different types of data. So that's, that's how you navigate the Borehole Manager database. It's a, it's a pretty simple interface. If I go to the map menu and choose borehole locations, then this is where I would create a simple map just plotting downhole um, T data information. If I click on the borehole symbol and label options, this is where I can turn on various types of labels. In this case, I have a symbol turned on, borehole IDs, and T data. And if I click on this T data op item right here, then I can tell the program what type of data I want to plot. Um, and I can specify a date range or an exact date. So in this case, I'm um, I'm going to display measure measurements for most of 2007. I'll click on OK and then click on the process button, and I end up with a map that basically just shows these callout boxes that lists um, the data in the database. What I'm going to do next is go to the view menu, and I'm going to disable, which means that the check boxes over here will, I'm going to disable or uncheck any boreholes that don't have an arsenic value above zero in the database. So I'll go to the time-based data, um, I'll check on the time-based data query, I'll choose arsenic, and I'll tell the program to only enable boreholes that, that have arsenic values that fall within this range. So if I click on apply, Notice that now only a certain number of boreholes are enabled in the project. Now if I go to the T-Data menu and choose to create a time graph map, um, I've told the program to plot just kind of a single time series graph for each hole that shows bar graphs um, that, that will um, represent changes in arsenic concentrations over time. And notice that the program now is only displaying the boreholes that are enabled in the database in this diagram. So that's another way that you can display your time-based concentration information in a map. And then the last thing I want to do is go to the strip logs menu and choose to do a multi-log section. In the 2D strip log designer, I've turned on a column to plot I data. So this would be actually benzene soil concentrations and a corresponding text column to the right of that that just plots the concentrations. And I've already chosen a cross section line, so I'll click on the process button. and a cross-section should be generated. And if I zoom in on this, you can see that we've got these scaled bars. So these really are kind of like downhole bar graphs where the extents of the bar represent concentration. And then I have concentration plotted to the right of that. So what I want to do next is go back to the PowerPoint presentation and move on to the next slide. Um, and this gives you some examples of how 3D data is, how, how data can be displayed in 3D. So we, what we often do is display 3D data as these color-coded cylinders or spheres. And Rockworks offers many options for controlling the sizes, shapes, and colors of these 3D options, of these 3D objects. And they can be displayed along with other information, such as model pathology or stratigraphy, aerial photos, maybe a CAD or a GIS map. Um, let me go back to Rockworks now and show you how the 3D strip logs work. And before I do anything, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable all of the boreholes now rather than just the few that actually contain hits of arsenic. I'll go to the strip logs menu and I'll choose multi-log 3D. And in the 3D strip log designer, I'm going to choose to plot some data from the T-data table. 
When you're plotting or modeling data from, a t from the T-Data table, you first have to tell the program what type of data you're plotting, and then you're going to typically set up some sort of time filter options. In this case, I'm telling the program to only plot data collected on a certain day. Um, we also have a lot of options for scaling and for fill style. Um, in this case, I'm actually telling the program to use this, spe this user-specified color scheme when determining the color of the cylind cylindrical shapes in the 3D view. So click on the process button. And I'll get a 3D view of these cylinders. And these cylinders basically are plotted, I believe, from the top of the water level, groundwater level, to the bottom of the hole, which represents the bottom of the screened interval. So it is showing us where, you know, where we are, um, where we are sampling our data. If I go back to the 3D strip log designer and choose to plot I data instead of T data, this is an example of some soil sample concentrations. And in this case, I've again used a color a color table to govern the color scheme for the the shapes, and I've used what we call an oblate shape instead of a cylindrical shape. Um, and in this case, because they're soil samples, I have multiple samples per hole, and the extents, um, the vertical extents of the oblate shapes represent the extents of the sample. So that's an example of how you can plot um, interval-based data where you have multiple samples in a borehole in 3D. All right, so I'll move back to the PowerPoint presentation. The next topic that I want to cover is the model formats. How do we take the data in our boreholes and get it into a format that can then be contoured or displayed in 3D, and how do we get volumetrics based on, on that information? When creating two-dimensional contour maps, Rockworks uses various interpol interpolation algorithms to create grids, and grids are really just evenly spaced arrays of numbers that approximate the concentration within each grid cell based on observed concentrations in nearby wells or boreholes. In this diagram, I'm showing a few well, well locations with posted observation concentration values along with the extents and values assigned to each grid cell. You'll typically see a gradational change of grid cell values as you move from one well to another. So in this example, you know, we have a value, a, a high concentration value of 400 for drill hole 3 and a high concentration value of 6 for drill hole 21, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. And you can see that um, the, the change in our modeled values as you move from one value, one cell to another, um, they're just, it's kind of a gradational change. Um, almost in, in, in some cases, it'll probably be kind of a linear spatial change. 3D models, which are often referred to as solid models or block models, are basically just composed of 3D grid cells or blocks. And the program, again, uses various interpolation methods to assign a concentration value to each block based on the values in the nearby wells or boreholes. Regardless of whether we're using a two-dimensional or three-dimensional model, um, regardless of whether a two-dimensional model or a three-dimensional model is being created in Rockworks, um, the program uses the same concept of taking this irregularly spaced data sampled from wells or boreholes and interpolating the data into these evenly spaced arrays of modeled values. The spacing for your cells, whether you're looking at a grid, a grid cell or these 3D cells, are all controlled through the, the project dimensions. Um, so the user has full control over, you know, how many cells you have in a model and their spacing. The next thing I wanted to show you is how to create a two-dimensional plume map in the program. So when you're working in the Borehole Manager, two-dimensional contour maps representing concentration are typically created through the statistics map menu available under the iData or tData menus, and typically the program will use the highest observed concentration value for a specific sampling event within each borehole or well to create a gridded contour map. These grids are typically displayed as contour maps 
um, perhaps with some color fill, or they can be displayed as cell maps, as we looked at earlier. And the program contains numerous tools for controlling display options, such as contour intervals and color schemes. So if you look at the contour map the, in this lower image, we've created the contour map. It includes contour lines as well as a color fill. And we've rendered you know, some of these the lowest values in the, the model transparent. And then we've added transparency to the plume itself as well so that you can see through it and, and into the, onto the aerial photo below it. So we do have you know, a lot of, lot of options for modifying how these plume maps are displayed in the program. Also keep in mind that typically your grids are your, con well not typically, but often your grids or contour maps are exported as DXF files or shape files for use in other mapping programs. So you can take the models created in Rockworks and get them into another program if you need to. What I'm going to do next is switch back to Rockworks and show you how you would create a plume, a plume map. So I'll go to the T-Data menu and I'll choose Statistics Map and Two-Dimensional. Again, I've told the program the name of the parameter that I want to contour and I've specified some filtering options. I've also told the program to, you, to use the highest T-Data value from each well. So in some cases we may have two screened intervals per well location, and we're telling the program to always use the highest value when creating the contour map. I've given, I've assigned a name to the grid that's going to be created, and there are a lot of different gridding options that you can choose from when you're, you're creating a, um, when you're creating a grid. I'll go ahead and click on the process button, and the program will create an initial map. And if, let's say I want to change something about this map. Say I want to maybe experiment with a different interpolation method. I can simply go back to the menu op options over here and say click on the gridding options and maybe turn on this logarithmic tool. And then just simply click, click on the process button and the map will be, and the grid actually will be regenerated. From here, I might want to add transparency to the model or an aerial photo or may want to overlay a map layer. Um, from, a, from AutoCAD or from GIS. All right, so now I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint and cover the 3D plume modeling. When 3D models are displayed, um, you have two options for how they're, for, for a display method. Isosurfaces, and it, we ha we're showing an example of an isosurface display in the top image in the slide. They're basically just skins or 3D surfaces that define the boundary between cells that are greater than or less than a user-specified ISO level. So they're really just like three-dimensional contour lines. In this upper image, you can see one isosurface displayed within another isosurface, and that's a really common way of displaying 3D plume models. 3D models can also be displayed using what we call the all-voxels setting in Rockplot 3D. And the image below that, the one that displays the red and the orange plume, uses this visualization technique. Um, in this case, rather than creating these three-dimensional skins, we're actually rendering each block within the model. So I think it's actually a good way to look at your model because it truly, it's a very good representation of, of how the, the model is actually, how the data is actually modeled with these, these little blocks. Um, and you also have a little bit um, more control over seeing changes, say, on the surface of a plume um, with changes in concentration. So regardless of which viewing option you choose, you can add cutouts to the model, as we've done with the lower plume image in the slide. And I should also mention that you can cut cross sections and 3D fence diagrams through the solid models. The Rockplot 3D viewer includes tools for calculating volumes as the ISO level or filter settings for a model are changed, which we think is a pretty powerful tool. I'm not sure if there are the other program, competing programs out there have, have that on-the-fly volumetrics calculations. So I'm going to switch back to the Rockworks program, and I'll start with showing you a T-Data model. So I'll go to the T-Data menu and choose Model. And I'm going to use a model that I've, I've already created just for the sake of speed. It takes a little while to create these models sometimes. But just keep in mind that when you're creating a model from the T-Data menu, you first specify the type of data that you want to use to create the model. 
you can specify a time-based filter, and you can also do things like resampling your data, which I often do when I have longer screens, um, because it adds additional control points within my screens, which, which, helps, which helps with interpolation, I think. Under the 3D dimensional diagrams option, I'm going to choose to display the model as an isosurface, and I'm going to make sure that I'm plotting my time-based data in my strip logs. So I'll click on the process button. And I end up with a model that looks like a big pink blob, which is really common. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, if I turn that off, what I want to do is adjust this legend so that the color scheme used for the legend matches the color scheme used for the strip logs. So under the legend, I'll go ahead and just double click on it and choose to link to a color table, which will contain those user defined intervals that I displayed. The next thing I want to do, I'll turn the model back on, I am going to assign the same color scheme to the model. So right here, I'll go to the color file, and if I click on apply, then the way the manner in which the model is displayed changes. The next thing I want to do is add an ISO level, and I want to add an ISO level of 1, something that's pretty low. So I'll go ahead and type in an ISO level value of 1 and click on Apply, and you should see that the shape of the model changes. And you may not have noticed this, but the, the volume displayed right here changed as well. It went down significantly from, you know, around 100,000 cubic feet to 28 or 29 cubic feet, so, or 28 or 29,000 million cubic feet. <laughs> so, so the program is doing this on-the-fly estimation of the volume that is displayed on your screen. I can add some transparency to the model. See, I can actually see through the model and see my measured data within the plume. And then what I'll do now is add an internal isosurface to this. So I'll right click and choose Add X Isosurface, and the program will automatically add an isosurface that I can then edit. And I'll go ahead and choose an ISO level that's much higher, say right above this, this color difference right here. So I'll type in an ISO level value of, say, 50.1. And at the same time, I'll go ahead and add some transparency, and I'll change the color to match the color scheme that's being used, and click on the Apply button. So that's an example of how you can display an ISO level within an ISO level in the 3D viewer. Um, keep in mind that you can add cutouts to these ISO levels as well, but what I'm going to do is show that in the next example. So I'll close this menu and go back to the iData menu and choose Model. Again, I'm going to use an existing model, um, but, but keep in mind, again, that you do have a lot of different options for filtering your data or modifying your interpolation method when you're creating a model, and that's actually probably a topic that we'll cover in another webinar in the future. Under the three-dimensional diagram options, I'll choose all voxels, and in my 3D strip logs, I'll turn off the T data strip logs and turn on the I data strip logs, and click on process. So here we, we, again, just get kind of what looks like a big pink blob when we initially open up the model. Um, I'm going to turn this legend off right now, and I'm going to go ahead and assign a new color scheme to the model. So I'll right-click and choose Options, and under the color scheme, I'll load the same color scheme that we're using to, for, for the strip log display. And what I'm going to do next is, once the color scheme changes, <laughs> I'm going to apply a filter. Now, when, when you're viewing the model with all of the voxels displayed like this, you can actually filter out either highs or lows in, in your model. Um, in this case, I'm still going to just filter out the low values, but keep in mind that if you're modeling other types of information where you may actually want to isolate lows instead of high values, then this visualization scheme lets you do that. 
So I've typed in a value of 25 and clicked on the Apply button, and the program is now calculating a volume right here for me. And you can see that it's a, a kind of a different look when you're visualizing the model. It's a little bit blockier of a look. But again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing since it's truly how the model is, is created. Um, what I'll do next is right-click on it and add a cutout so you can see how the cutouts work. When you're adding a cutout, you specify the corner in which the, the cutout's going to exist, and then you can use your mouse to control the extents of the cutout. So if I click on Apply now, you can see that the program's cut out kind of a corner of the plume. And I can interactively adjust that until I get it to the extents that I want to. So that's how that works. Um, one thing that I, back to the slide, one thing that I didn't mention when we were covering um, within the, when I was covering this slide is that three-dimensional ISO surfaces and even these solid models and the strip logs as well can all be exported as 3D DXF files as well as shape files. So if you wanted to take these models into, say, ArcScene or AutoCAD for visualization, you, you can do that. At this point, that really, that really covers the presentation for now. We've gone a little bit over, gone a little bit longer than we planned. So, um, I know that some questions came in. Were there? Um, so that was about the labeled cell maps. Okay. Sure. We had a question about how to create those labeled cell maps. If I go, and this is available for any type of gridding tool that we have in the program. So anytime you can create a 2D contour map, you can create these labeled cells. If I go back to the T data menu and go to statistics map in two dimensional, if I were to turn off, say, the contoured line and the colors and colored intervals and turn on the labeled cells, and click on the process button, the program would display the cells rather than the contours. So that's how you do that. I want to leave you with some additional information about resources available on our website. First, you can find case studies, support tips, and also a blog. We offer a fully functional 15-day trial period for Rockworks, so I would encourage you to download the software and give it a try. We have a very active support forum, and we've recently posted several new how-to videos on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to contact us with questions at either sales at rockware.com or tech at rockware.com. Thanks again for joining us.